Welcome everybody to today's episode of The Lindsay Elmore Show. Today we tackle one of the most controversial issues of our time. How do we adequately protect those at high risk for coronavirus and the resultant mortality that may come from COVID-19? while balancing that there is a great number of people at low risk for infection, low risk for death, who want to be able to go about their activities of daily living, not only because of the personal freedom that that allows, but because it also allows them to go and care for chronic diseases such as heart disease, mental health disorders, and do appropriate screenings for diseases that may develop slowly and over time, such as cancer. Today, I interview Dr. Martin Koldorf. He is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. His research centers on developing new epidemiological and statistical methods for the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks and for the post-marketing surveillance of drug and vaccine safety. He, along with Dr. Sunetra Gupta and Dr. J. Bhattacharya, are authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. The three of them, as infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, express grave concerns throughout the declaration about the damaging physical and mental health impact of COVID-19 policies, and they recommend that instead of total lockdowns, we approach controlling the infection from the standpoint of focused protection, whereby we put major controls and prevention techniques surrounding at-risk groups, including the elderly and those with chronic disease and obesity, while allowing people who are at low risk to go about their activities of daily living, such as going to school, going to church, going to the grocery store, going to the university without limitations. To date, the Great Barrington Declaration has been signed by over 660,000 concerned citizens, medical and public health scientists, and medical practitioners. During my discussion today, we talk about what is the role of a lockdown? Has it ever been used in the past to prevent the spread of infectious disease? What are the unforeseen consequences of lockdown that have nothing to do with infection? What are the problems with zero COVID case countries where even one case of COVID-19 is too many for the government to handle? We also talk about the development of a vaccine, whether or not natural herd immunity will perhaps occur at the same rate faster, and will it be as long lasting as a vaccine would be? We also talk about some of the more controversial language surrounding COVID-19. We talk about contact tracing and whether or not it is an effective measure to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. We speak in rational terms about how we can come to a middle ground whereby we focus our protective efforts on those who are the most at risk while allowing those who are at low risk to live as normally as possible. Is it really a possibility? Let's get to the show. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. Dr. Martin Koldorf, welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. I'm very excited to speak with you today. I love the work that you and your colleagues have been doing to bring some rationale and a different perspective to the coronavirus debate. And so let's just start, you know, you take on 
the role of lockdowns in history. So talk to us about what a lockdown is and how it it has had a successful or an unsuccessful history against infectious disease battles. Well, there isn't much of a history because it's a new thing. So lockdowns is a new experiment that we're not trying worldwide. worldwide. And uh, uh, if you look at pandemic preparedness plans that most countries had before, before this year started, they don't talk about lockdowns. Uh, they talk about protecting those that are at highest risk, which will vary depending on what the disease is. Uh, but that was sort of the plan that people have prepared for. And the uh, lockdown is not mentioned in any of those pandemic preparedness plans. Including the World Health Organization's pandemic preparedness plans. There was never a global lockdown. And so lockdowns, as, as we've seen it here in the United States, has meant the closing of schools, the closing of restaurants, the closing of movie theaters, and most especially you know, we think about closing of parks and outdoor facilities. And so what do you think some of the unforeseen consequences of these lockdowns are? There are huge uh, collateral damage from the lockdowns, uh, which is very, very tragic. If we start with the children, like you mentioned, uh, education is very, very important for children. So an in-person Schools are very important for proper education, but it's not just education. We also know that schools are important for physical health and for mental health and for social development. So uh, we are really putting a, a huge burden on our children by closing the schools. And of course, those children that are most uh, affected are the working class children because wealthier children from wealthier families, they can put them in a private school or hire a tutor or do pod schooling, et cetera. But uh, this is very tragic for the children. And it's very ironic because children are not at risk from COVID-19. The risk to children from COVID-19 is less than uh, uh, from the annual flu. And an example of that is is Sweden, which was the only major Western country that did not close schools uh, through the height of the pandemic in the spring. So they were open from daycare and schools from age one to 15. And among the 1.8 million children in Sweden during this time period, there were exactly zero COVID-19 deaths and only a handful of hospitalizations. So you mention you mention how important it is to look at risk. And so it, it sounds like what you're saying is that the risk is so low to children that children should go to school because otherwise they're missing all of the other benefits that come from being within school. But let's swing to the other side. Who are the people who are most at risk and how do you recommend that they take precautions against contracting coronavirus and perhaps becoming quite ill from coronavirus? Yeah, so first when we talk about uh, risk, we have to differentiate between risk of getting infected because everybody can get infected. and about equal risk. So there, there is risk throughout our ages. So we're talking about the risk of mortality for other serious uh, uh, disease, like hospitalization and so on. So if we look at uh, mortality, the high risk are the older people. And, and it's not just that they're twice as risk or 10 times at risk, or even 100 times higher risk for mortality is more than a thousand fold difference in risk in mortality from COVID-19 if you compare the oldest versus the youngest. And that's a huge difference. And for for old people, COVID-19 is a very serious and very dangerous disease and much more so than the annual influenza. Uh, So that's the first part of your, your question. The second one is how do we do to protect them? And uh, first of all, we have really failed doing that. We have failed miserably uh, protecting uh, the old and vulnerable population. Uh, So how do we do it? Well, the highest risk are people in nursing homes and similar care settings, because not only are they old, but they're also frail often. 
So uh, what we have to do that, unless the staff is immune because they've had it already, they need to be frequently tested. Uh, and uh, also visitors, because it's important for these uh, uh, nursing home residents to have visitors from their relatives and friends. But it's important that there's test, testing also visitors. So if you want to visit your grandfather uh, and you happen to be positive, then you need to postpone that visit by three weeks until you, uh, but maybe your cousin can come instead or something. Uh, it's also important to minimize staff rotation so that the same resident is not exposed to 10 persons on every day and then 10 other people the next day. So to minimize the number of staff that they actually interact with to uh, maybe half a dozen or so. Uh, of course, also we have to be very careful so that new residents, we don't send people with COVID-19 to the nursing homes. So those are some of the things we can do to uh, uh, protect the nursing homes. Another group are the people who uh, live by themselves, uh, retired, or maybe they live with a spouse or somebody else of similar age who's also retired. So they need to be very careful. They shouldn't go to the pubs, uh, in the crowded pub, uh, but uh, 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 they should be outdoors and walk because physical activity is important. So they should go to the park or to the to the hiking trails or uh, go bicycling or, or whatever they enjoy doing. So physical activity and outdoor activity is important. Going to the supermarket might not be the most important thing for them to do. So we should uh, uh, arrange so that groceries and other necessities can be delivered to them uh, at home so they don't have to risk them there. Uh, visiting a family, seeing family and friends is important. So. If you can do it outdoors, that's great. And if not, uh, there should be testing available so that when they get visited by their grandchildren, for example, or, or son or daughter, that they can do testing. So that's what we can do for older people who live by themselves. For, for people in their 60s, they're not at very high risk, but they're still at somewhat high risk. And many of them are uh, working. What we're doing now is uh, we are protecting low-risk college students and low-risk professionals like uh, 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 journalists and scientists like me, uh, bankers, attorneys, etc., who can work from home even though they have very little risk. While we are putting working class older people who have high risk, they still have to work. Uh, driving a cab or uh, being working as a janitor, working in the supermarket or the post office or whatever. So uh, uh, there is, they are exposed and they are putting the burden to develop the immunity in the population that will eventually protect all of us. So it's important that they can work from home uh, if that's possible. And if they have a work that's, that's not possible, we should arrange for them to be able to take a sabbatical, maybe using social security funds, for example, for three to four months so that they can take a sabbatical during the time when there's a lot of transmission in the community and sort of uh, uh, face that with uh, when there is a lot of transmission. 